Recording has started. All right, welcome back. So we have done the second meter, and now we will move to the last topic of the 3030. That is the memory subsystem and the memory devices and circuits. So we will have uh, four or five lectures around this topic. And we'll have one more homework five. And then that's for the rest of the semester. So the final exam will be cumulative. That means we will cover all the lectures from the beginning. So today we are going to discuss about the memory system. And uh, we are going to show an overview. In the, in the following lectures, we are going to discuss about the specific memory technologies. But today is just an overview. So here, this is a reference chapter from the Edward Smith textbook. And the recorded materials from last spring. So here we are going to talk about the memory. So first of all, in the volume architecture for the computer organization. So this is a generic uh, diagram you may have seen before. So we have the processor, for example, the CPU, central processing unit, for the logic computation. But it may need to fetch the data from the memory. So here this memory can be the DRAM, the dynamic random access memory. So the data is saved in the memory. And then the processor needs to give the address to the memory to locate where the data is stored. And then the read process happens on the memory. And then you get the data. And then the data is transferred back to the processor through the data bus. And then the processor will do some computation. For example, you may have the multiplier or adder to do some logic computation. And after that, the data is stored back to the memory. So this is a, a general idea of the volume architecture. So for the processor, uh, it's complicated. And uh, it's made typically of this ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. And uh, as I discussed, you may have the multiplier, adder, or other digital logic function. So for that, we're not going to discuss more details in the 3030. But we talk about the digital circuit building block, that is the inverter. So more complex logic gates, NAND gate, NOR gate, or even an XOR gate can be made of the inverter. Uh, uh, in the, can be made using the similar principle as the inverter. So we are going to just talk about the inverter as an example for the logic function in the processor in this 3030. And then we're going to switch the topic to the memory for the rest of the semester. Because the memory circuits are different from the logic and land gate or log gate or the inverter. So the complete uh, system may have the I.O. devices as well, like your keyboard, speaker, and so on, monitor. So the data is transferred through the data bus between different components of the system. And today we are going to talk about the memory in more details. So we are going to look at the memory subsystem in the following. So the memory subsystem actually has a hierarchy like this. So this hierarchy is made of different, tech, different memory technologies. So here we show this diagram where we have uh, let's say a processor, like CPU, this uh, blue box is a CPU. And on the CPU, we may have the core. And uh, in the core, it may have the ALU for the logic function and the compute. And then the core may have its local register to store some temporal data. And out of that, we may have this cache on the processor as well. So here the cache, we have different levels. 
next the level 1, L1, level 2, L2, level 3, L3. So those caches are made of the SRAM technology. And we're going to discuss the SRAM in the next lecture. So SRAM is a static random access memory. It's one type of memory that is used for the cache. So here, the SRAM is on chip. Okay. On chip means on the same processor's chip. Okay. The S RAM is on the same chip as the processor's core. So here we have different levels of the cache. The difference is that the capacity is increasing from the L1 to L3. For example, L1 cache, the total capacity is about 32 kilobytes in this example. So here, just emphasize bytes is the capital B, the big B is bytes, and one byte is eight bits, the small b. So the L1 cache in this case 32 kilobytes, and L2 128 kilobytes, and L3 8 megabytes. So you see that we are going to increase the size uh, from L1 to L3, but at the same time, the access latency, this is the access time, that means the time you spend to read or write the data, also increase from L1 to L3. So L1 is like uh, 1 nanosecond, L2 in this case 2 nanoseconds, and then L3 is 5 nanoseconds. So here we see the trade-off between the capacity and the speed. So here the S run uh, is used for the on-chip cache implementation. And this is uh, uh, for the processor. And then outside the processor, that means off-chip, and not the same chip. So here we have the D run. So D run is uh, typically used as a working memory. Working memory. Or the main memory. So the capacity of DRAM is much larger than the SRAM. So DRAM today can have like 8 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, or even larger. So the DRAM, we are going to spend like one lecture on DRAM itself later. But DRAM speed is much slower. So you may need 40 nanoseconds to read or write the data from the DRAM. And then both SRAM and DRAM are categorized as volatile memory. So those two are volatile memory. So what does this mean? The volatile means your data is gone when the power is off. So if you turn off the power supply, then the data you stored in the S run or in the D run will be lost. So this is only for the temporal storage. And uh, this is uh, the volatile memory. And then if you want to store the data for a long time, then you have to switch to this non-volatile memory, NVM. And here we have two candidates for that. One is the SSD, solid state drive. This is made of the flash transistor. We're going to spend one lecture on this later. So this is uh, the non volatile memory. That means you can store the data for a long time, even you turn off the power supply. And flash memory can be like 5 to 12 gigabytes these days, or even up to 1 terabyte. But you need longer time to read the data from the flash, for example, 50 microseconds. And then this is the, the magnetic hard disk drive. So this is hard drive. And this is uh, an old fashion uh, of the data storage. And, but you can have even larger capacity, up to like 10 terabytes. But you may need milliseconds to read the data from the hard drive. 
So nowadays for the mobile devices, uh, SSD is the mainstream. But the hard disk drive is also still being used in the like uh, data center for the large capacity long-term data storage. So this is for archiving purpose. So in this uh, 3030, we are going to spend uh, three lectures on the S1, D1, Flash, respectively, in the following. So here, as you can see, further away from the processor's core, then the capacity of the memory is going to increase. At the same time, the access latency will also increase. So this is the idea of this memory hierarchy. You have different levels in the memory system with different characteristics. For example, different capacity, different latency. So these are implemented with different technologies. So any questions so far? Okay, so this is uh, again another diagram for this uh, memory hierarchy. So this basically is similar as the previous slide. And here we have this processor's core in this dash box. And then we have the, the core. Nowadays we have the multi cores. And within the core, we may have the register and made of the flip flop. And then the L1 cache made of the S1. So the L1 cache may be private to each core. So your L1 cache actually you can divide that into two types. One is to store the instruction, one is to store your data. And then the L2 cache, you may have a few L2 cache. That's all the core. That means they are shared between the different cores. That means the data in the L2 cache can be accessed by either core one or core two. And also you have a big L3 cache. This is typical in today's processor. You can find that in the smartphone, in your laptop. And in some servers, you may have the L4 cache for very high performance system. So this is the uh, 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 cache made of the S1. And then the D1, you may see this kind of a green circuit board. If you open the mainframe of your desktop on the motherboard, you will see this uh, kind of so-called uh, DIMM, D-I-M-M, -M, is dual inline memory module. And on, to, on, on this kind of circuit board, you have those uh, packaged DRAM chip. And then you may have the SSD and the hard disk drive. So here again, this is the trade-off between the speed and the capacity of the memory in different technologies. And here the speed can also be uh, quantified using the CPU cycles. For example, here for the register, it's always one clock cycle. And for the uh, level one to level three cache, you may need a few cycles to tens of cycles to access the data. So here the size uh, in terms of the bytes. So here we have the typical uh, typical scale for that. So here K is kilo, 10 to the power 3. M is mega, 10 to the power 6. So kilo and mega is not exactly the same as 1000 or 1 million, because kilo actually is uh, uh, 2 to the power 10. So that's, that is 1024, 1024. So it's close to 1,000. So the mega is 2 to the power uh, 20, I think. So then it's close to 1 million. So here is giga, close to 1, 10 to the power 9. Tera is close to 10 to the power 12. Keta is like 10 to the power 15. So this is the scale of those uh, memory capacity. And the uh, S run static random access memory, DRAM, dynamic random access memory, and flash-based SSD. So we're going to spend three lectures on those. Uh, we're going to have more in-depth 
discussions on each of those. So here, just give you some ideas. For example, uh, you can check the specs of your uh, system. For example, if uh, you are in the Windows and you open the task manager, uh, uh, then you can have the CPU information here. So in my case, so I have this Intel i7 8th generation CPU, and uh, right now I'm running on the turbo mode, uh, higher than the nominal clock frequency. And uh, here I just want to show the cache. So L1 cache in this case, 256 kilobytes. L2 1 megabyte, L3 8 megabytes. So I think this is a representative for today's uh, processor. Let's say high end processor because this is i7. Um, but my computer was purchased like two years ago, so you may have different specs now. And here you also have the memory, but this memory is for the DRAM. So this uh, memory is for the DRAM. In my case, I have 16 gigabytes in total. So uh, right now it's kind, kind of half of them are used. And this disk, in my case, is a flash and it's a Samsung SSD. And uh, in my case, it's 512 gigabytes, but uh, you know, due to some formatting issues, the active, the available space is lower than lower than 512 gigabytes. But in my case, it's 512 gigabytes SSD. So we're going to discuss the SRAM here, used in the cache, and the DRAM used for this main memory, and then the flash for the SSD in the following three lectures. But today we are going to just uh, provide an overview of the memory system. So any questions so far? Okay, so here this is uh, again the trade-off between the area and the access time for different technologies here. So here the area is the area for one bit information storage. So this is area to store one bit information. One bit means digital zero or one. So S1 will spend the most area to store one bit information. D1 will spend less. Flash will be even less. So here, this is going to be translated as the integration density. So S run, the integration density is low, very low. And then D run is kind of high, flash is very high. This is also translated to the cost. You think about donor for one bit. So for S run, you may spend more donor to fabricate one S run cell. The reason is because of the area. If you think about the total chip, the silicon area is the same. And S run, each cell is going to be larger than the D run. Then you have, on the same silicon area, you will have less number of S runs. In other words, the S runs unit cost will be higher than the DRAM. And the unit cost of DRAM will be higher than the flash. So we have this trade-off. And then the access time. So basically SRAM is fast, like uh, one nanosecond. And DRAM is tens of nanoseconds. Flash is tens of microseconds. So this is slow. So here you have to pay, f pay more price to basically run it fast in the S run. So there's a trade-off. So you, of course you want no cost and fast memory, but in reality you have to be high cost for the fast memory. 
So that's why we have this hierarchy in the memory system. There is no single memory that can satisfy all the needs. So either it's fast, but more cost, or it's slow, but lower cost. So this is why we have this hierarchy. So here we are going to quantify the memory cell area using the metric uh, like this F square. So what is F? F is a lithography and technology load. That is a feature size of this technology load. That means the minimal size, minimal dimension of this uh, technology feature size. So if you think about the unit area, that will be F times F in the two-dimensional space on the silicon surface. So you have F by F, this is like unit area, F square. So we're going to quantify the memory technologies into the F square. So how many F square to build one s run cell? So here we have a range, like 150 to 300 F square, depends on the application, which means depends on which level of the s run cache, L1 to L3. So the L3 will be smaller. So this is 150 is probably L3 cache, and 300 is probably L1 cache, and in between is L2. So L1 is the fastest, is closer to the processor's core. That means you have to spend a larger area to build the S run cell. So later you will see that it's basically larger W over L of the transistor. When you design the L1 cache, you have to use larger transistor to make it faster. So here, this is the range for the S1 in terms of F square. And then D1 is much smaller, more compact, 6 F square. Then the S1, you see that this is like 30 times to six, uh, 50 times uh, smaller in terms of the cell area. And I have to emphasize for the S run, D run is binary memory, binary cell. That means one cell can only store one bit per cell. That means for one S run cell, later you will see that is made of six transistors. So those six transistors as one cell can only store one bit information. And DRAM, as you see later, it will be one transistor, one capacitor. So this one cell can only store one bit information. You either store zero or one, one bit per cell. Okay. This is for S run and DRAM. Now let's look at the NAND flash. The flash nowadays is typically made of the NAND structure, so we call NAND flash. And the NAND flash, uh, the very basic design of the NAND flash will have a 4F square unit area. So that means it's 2F by 2F. So this is uh, the unit area for the NAND flash. Later you will see that NAND flash is a single transistor. So basically one transistor store like uh, occupy. 2F by 2F space on the silicon surface. But this is a two-dimensional land flash and uh, with single level cell. Single level cell is the same as this binary cell. It's one bit per cell. But the flash can store multi-level per cell. So this is the difference between flash versus the S1 and D1. So for the flash, this multi-level cell means one transistor here, basically here you have one transistor. And this one transistor can store two bits per cell, or even three bits per cell. So we will talk about how this is realized later when we talk about the land flash in more details. But here conceptually, you can think one transistor can store two bit information. Two bit information means what? means you can store 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, four states. 
that means two bits. So you can store that within one cell. This is a way to increase the integration density because on one cell you are going to store two bit information or even three bits. So equivalently the area to store one bit information will be 4f squared divided by 2 if it's 2 bit per cell or 4f squared divided by 3 if it's 3 bit per cell. So this will be even more compact uh, if you compare to the D run. So this will be 2f squared, this will be 1.6f squared. So this is a 2D NAND flash which was very popular maybe five years ago. But in the recent uh, five years, the industry has made a breakthrough in the flash technology to further increase the integration density by doing this 3D integration. So previously, this is a 2D NAND flash. And the way to increase the in density or make the cost even lower is to make a 3D structure. And uh, here the basic idea is that we are going to, so basically for the one NAND flash cell, it's one transistor. But in the 2D case, it's just like what we typically have. You have a silicon substrate and you have the transistor like this. So this is on the this is like what we have discussed so far. So you have the silicon substrate and then on this two-dimensional substrate, you know, you have one transistor and this transistor occupy 2F by 2F, 4F square space. In order to further increase the density, so the idea is that, so right now, if you draw the circuit symbol, it's like this. The idea is to make the transistor stack vertically. So if you think about the transistor, we can stack it vertically like this. And then on the bottom, still is the 2F by 2F space. But on this two-dimensional space, you stack a layers of the transistor vertically. Oops. Then equivalently each transistor will only occupy 4f squared divided by n this space equivalently. And then this multi uh, tier or this vertical 3D can, uh, integration can be coupled with the multi level cell. So if it's n layer and the memory cell is 2 bit per cell, then the equivalent area for 1 bit information is this 4f squared divided by 2 for the 2 bit per cell and then divided by n for the n layer. If it's 3 bit per cell, then you divide by 3, n. n is the number of layers. So today, the n can be up to 128. If you look at the uh, product from, for example, Samsung, Micron, or, or, or the uh, SK Hynix, then you will see that the number of layers for today's 3D NAND flash can be up to 128 layers. And then you can see this is very small in terms of the area to store one bit information. So that's why today's SSD becomes so cheap compared to maybe five years ago. So this is uh, because of the 3D integration. I would say the 3D integration is a general trend for the future of the semiconductor or microelectronics. So for the IC, this is for sure going to be the trend. So any questions here? Okay, so here this is uh, the cell area 